Good afternoon, thank you all for being here. My name is Ann Barnhart. Um, I'm not gonna go through a whole lot of biographical information. In fact, I'm not gonna do a whole lot of bio at all. If you or anyone out there on the internet is interested in learning about me, all you have to do is Google my name, A-N-N-B-A-R-N-H-A-R-D-T, and you can enjoy hours and hours of reading and uh, video watching fun. I'm not gonna waste time with, with biographical information because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Furthermore, it really doesn't matter who I am. Um, all I'm doing is I am relaying to you objective reality, objective truth. Who I am really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If you all want to think of me as nothing more than the weather girl, then that's fine by me. I'm just communicating this information to you. All right, let's get started. The title of this presentation is The Economy is Going to Implode and You Deserve to Understand Why. Um, most people out there have absolutely no idea of what is going on in the financial markets, in the economy, and they especially do not understand the scope of what's going on in the financial sector and in the economy and the fact that we have now passed critical mass and it can no longer be saved. What I want to get out in front of people is the very basic nitty gritty in layman's terms of what's going on so that the average American out there can understand the true gravity of the situation and I'm also going to impart a few suggestions for what can be done to fix the situation after the collapse, after the war, and in the rebuilding phase. Because if you're watching this, chances are you are going to be in that class of people who is going to be morally tasked with rebuilding this nation and this civilization. There's some things you need to know. You need to understand how this system is broken, and you also need to understand what you're going to need to do to fix it and get it back on the right track when you come out the other side of this. Um, for those of you out there on the internet watching, a lot of you will be saying, well, you didn't go into enough detail about this. You weren't technical enough about that. Guys, you got to understand what my objective here is. My objective here is not to dive into the absolute minutia of the MF global collapse. These people don't even understand what repos are. These people don't understand what CDS is. They don't understand any of these things. I just need to get a very basic primer in front of them so that they can understand these things. Um, also, do not email me and say, um, why didn't you talk about this? Why didn't you talk about that? Why didn't you talk about the other? In order to get just the very basics covered, we're looking at two, two and a half hours I'm estimating here, okay? Most people in this country have about a 30 second attention span. So you can see the wall that I'm up against here. Um, if you think that there's a topic that I didn't cover that needs to be covered, God bless you. Make your own YouTube. Put it up on the internet so that everybody can see it. But I'm just gonna cover what I think is the very basics in this presentation, and hopefully we'll get it under 2.30. Question, how much of your wealth is allocated as zeros and ones on computer servers? How much is physical in your possession and defensible? For most people, the bulk of their wealth is completely indefensible. The bulk of their wealth they have really no true custody of and it could be confiscated instantaneously. What I've been saying to people for months and months and months and going on years now is, is that if you can't stand in front of it with an assault rifle and physically defend it, it's not really yours. Anything sitting in any sort of an account doesn't actually exist. It is, doesn't exist physically. It is zeros and ones on a computer server. And you have to trust the people behind the computer servers, A, not to confiscate it, and B, to allow you to have access to it, and that it is going to have zero counterparty risk when you get it back. These are all questions that are monumentally huge. MF Global, 1.6 billion in segregated, sacrosanct customer funds, confiscated, stolen, like that, by John Corzine and his cronies at MF Global. Um, PFG Best, 
another Ponzi scheme, 225 million in customer funds, never actually existed. The whole thing was a Ponzi scheme. Me personally, I can testify to this. This is being recorded on November 2nd, 2012. A week ago today, I have declared a federal tax strike. A week ago today, the IRS levied my personal bank account. Bye-bye money gone it will and I'll never see it again okay so if this money is sitting in these accounts and it's just zeros and ones on a computer server you have to understand the massive massive risk and and people in this culture we're so used to the rule of law we're so used to the sacrosanct nature of our accounts that we cannot even fathom the possibility that our money could just be confiscated and taken away. You have to understand the risk that you are that you are standing right now, every one of you. It doesn't matter how honest your brokers, wealth managers, or local bankers are. The problem is systemic and it will touch every person on earth. I hear this all the time. I have people call me all the time and say, well, I'm all right because my broker is a great guy. I'm sure your broker is a great guy. I'm sure your banker is a great guy and wouldn't dream of stealing your money out of your account. That's not the counterparty. That's not the danger. That's not who we're talking about. We are talking about what is called the federal government. We are talking about the entire global financial system. It doesn't matter how honest your brokers are. This is why I shut down my commodity brokerage. Because I knew after MF Global that I could do nothing nothing to defend my clients and their assets that were sitting in my commodity brokerage. It doesn't matter how awesome and how honest I may be. There was nothing I could do to protect my clients. If my FCM went under the same way that MF Global went under, and my FCM did eventually go under about seven months later, not in the same fashion, but it went under. I could not protect my clients. I didn't have the wealth myself to backstop my clients' accounts. If their money got corzined, so to speak, the way the MF Global customers got corzined, I could not have done anything to help them. And I could not live with that. You can steal all of my money. You can take everything I own. You can put me in the gutter to where I'm living in a refrigerator box under the bridge. That's fine, but you're not going to take my client's money. So I had to shut my firm down and I had to get them out. That was the only moral option for me. You have to understand this. It doesn't have anything to do with how, how honest and good your local guys are because this isn't a local problem. This is big. This is as big as it gets. What is money? First of all, um, as you're watching and going through, um, we have the workbook available. You should have been able to download the workbook off of the link underneath the YouTube clip in the information section. So you've got your workbook hopefully at home if you want. The fellas here in the room, they all have their workbook. The way it works is, is on the slide, this turquoise number here is the page that I'm on in the workbook. The first three pages of the workbook was just very simply uh, the going galt letter that I wrote in November of 2011 when I shut down my brokerage firm. That's just provided for you. That's the only biographical information I'll provide. You can see pretty much how I feel and what happened to me by reading that letter. Now we are into the workbook and we're on page five. The question is, what is money? Money is a fungible proxy for man's ability to reason, labor, create, and produce. People do not understand what money is. Money is, in a sense, it gets into, into in a sense, the spiritual and the metaphysical. Because like I said, it is a fungible proxy for man's ability to rate, reason, labor, create, and produce. It is, in essence, your, your humanity turned into this fungible proxy that we use for exchange. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, what does fungible proxy mean? Well, first of all, proxy. Proxy means uh, a representative agent, a substitution, OK? What does fungible mean? Fungible means um, that it is completely interchangeable. I could get into my wallet, and I could pull out a $100 bill, 
and I could exchange my $100 bill with the $100 bill of the gentleman that's sitting right here in front of me. Those $200 bills, even though they're physically different pieces of paper, they are, for all intents and purposes, exactly the same thing. They represent the same thing. That is fungibility. Why do we have the need for a fungible currency and this is universal throughout human history why must there be this this fungible proxy because for example my business okay i was in the cattle business my skill set was teaching cattlemen how to trade cash cattle that's my skill set what what use does that skill set have to this gentleman who's sitting right here in front of me who has nothing to do with the cattle industry? I can't trade or barter with him in terms of my personal skill set. Now, let's, let's say, for example, that the gentleman sitting in front of me, and I'm just making this up, let's say that he is in the, uh, let's say he's in the steel manufacturing business. Well, he can neither pay me in steel because I, as I stand here, have no real use or application for steel. I, I can't do anything with that. If we even get more specific back to my, my old vocation in agriculture, I'm, what if I had a, a guy come to one of my cattle marketing classes who also did some farming? Let's say he was a wheat farmer. Could he pay me in bushels, physical bushels of wheat? Again, you can say, well, Ann, you could, use, you could use wheat. Sure, but I don't have any ability to process the wheat. I can't mill it. I can't turn it into flour. And even then, do I need, how, how many pounds of flour do I need, really? How many can I personally consume? So you can see why humanity, from the very earliest days, went to this system where we have to have this fungible proxy, this currency that we can exchange with each other that is a proxy for our, our labor, our, pro our productivity, our creativity, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can all have an extremely efficient means of doing business and having economic activity with each other without having to find the person who deals in exactly the commodity that I need right this second, and then can I even process it or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's what money is. At the end of the day, it is a proxy for your humanity, your humanity, your ability to work. Don't forget that because that's so important. What is fungibility? We've already gone through that. It's the ability to mutually substitute individual units. Okay, humanity started using precious metals as that fungible proxy. They looked at gold and silver and they said, hmm, look at this, this interesting, beautiful yellow metal that we can dig out of the ground. Um, it's very pretty, it's, uh, it's rare, and it doesn't rust, it doesn't erode or corrode. So let's do this, let's dig this metal out of the ground Let's turn it into coins, and then those coins will be what we use to substitute for our ability to work and labor. Ah, good idea. Okay, and then humanity evolved into paper currencies, and we'll talk about paper currencies a little more in a bit. As I said, my ability to teach people how to trade cash cattle is not is not terribly fungible. It's very specific. Therefore, I am paid in fiat currency. I am paid in, right now, US dollars. All currency, ladies and gentlemen, is fiat, including gold. Gold is fiat currency. All currency is fiat currency because all currency is a fungible proxy for your ability as a human to labor and produce. What does the word fiat mean in Latin? It means let it be. And that's exactly what they did millennia ago with, with gold. They looked at it and they said, let that be the substitution for my ability to produce. And everybody agreed to this. Let gold be money. Let US dollars be money. Let zeros and ones on a computer server be money. Let Tide detergent be money. Do you guys know that this is going on? Do you know that in the inner cities already that the big bottles of Tide uh, uh, laundry detergent is being used in the inner cities as a currency? And it's equivalent to roughly 20 bucks. 
if you go to the store and look and you'll buy one of the big ones, it's about 20 bucks, they will go into stores and they will shoplift out cartloads, cartloads of Tide detergent, and then it, it is being used on the street in the inner cities as a currency. Isn't that interesting? So really, anything, it, whenever humanity says, let that be money, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a fiat currency. Therefore, all currencies, including gold, are fiat currencies. Time literally is money because money is the proxy for human capacity and productivity. Time is money. Don't forget this. We're going to come back to this when we're talking about interest in a few minutes, okay? It is the substitution, and we even quoted in that. How much are you paid per hour? How many dollars per hour is your wage? Because you have to pass through time in order to be productive, in order to do anything. Okay, just nailing all these concepts down because they're so important and it seems to me nobody understands any of this anymore, including the people running the Federal Reserve. Not that they aren't criminals in the first place, but you know the point I'm making. All right, so let's, let's walk through this thought about time being money. Now we're on page six in your workbook. The U.S. GDP is approximately how much? Do you know? Do you know what GDP is? It's about 15 and a half trillion. Fill that in in your workbook. 15 and a half trillion, and I use triple T for my abbreviation for trillion, so you know. Average wage, let's call the average wage in the, in the United States, not in China, in the United States, let's call that $20 an hour, okay? 20 bucks an hour. The average work year, standard work year is 2,000 hours, okay? Now let's do some math off of this. Fifteen and a half trillion, lots of zeros there kids, make sure you get all those zeros in there, divided by twenty dollars per hour means that the GDP is actually, that's a big number, can you read what it is? It's seven hundred and seventy-five billion man hours per year if we use 20 bucks an hour as an average wage, okay? I want you all to start thinking about the size of this economy, not in terms of dollars, because it seems to me that, that these numbers in terms of dollars don't even mean anything to anyone anymore. Someone says a trillion and people just shrug their shoulders. You know, trillion, billion, quadrillion. We're gonna start, pretty soon, we're gonna start talking about quadrillions, okay? And it just doesn't have any meaning. Let's turn this into man hours and see if we can't recapture that sense of meaning, okay? So we're looking at the United States gross domestic product is basically 775 billion man hours. 775 billion total man hours divided by 2,000 hours per work year means that the U.S. GDP is something like 387,500,000 total man years. That's the U.S. GDP in just one year. Okay, thinking about this in terms of time puts a completely different perspective on it, doesn't it? 387 million man years, okay? Since money is a proxy, the true underlying unit of GDP is man hours or man years. Don't forget this, we're gonna circle right back around to this at the very end. The true units of GDP, don't talk to me anymore in terms of dollars because the, the unit of the dollar itself is, be, is becoming increasingly more and more meaningless in a sense. Think about this and talk to me in terms of how many man hours are we talking about here? And then think about the levels of debt in terms of man hours, because ladies and gentlemen, that is how it will be paid. It will either be paid in man hours, land acquisition, or blood. Remember this for later. Currency solution. On page six, jot this down. Here's a solution for you. After the collapse, after the war, when you all come out the other side, you're gonna have to understand this. 
The gold standard is not necessary. And here's where all the Ron Paul people's heads are going to explode. I don't care. You need to understand this.